Commission. We have a quorum present. The responsibilities of the Plan Commission include holding hearings and preparing recommendations to the City Council on changes to the comprehensive plan, other planning documents, and the zoning ordinance itself, including the map that's part of the zoning ordinance. And that's what we'll be doing tonight. Uh, we will conduct a hearing on a proposed text amendment to remove the phrase drive-through facility from a list of prohibited uses in sub-area 6 of the Central Street overlay and uh, also a hearing on a petition by Evmark, the contract purchaser of certain property to change the zoning from R2 single-family residential and place it within the B1A <coughs> business zoning district, which permits commercial and retail use. Um, the um, Chase Bank has a, a specific proposal which requires these changes and also requires a special use. We will not be considering the special use. Um, that will be, if, if the matters before us tonight are approved by the City Council, then the ZBA will conduct a hearing on the special use. Uh, generally, amendments are passed or not passed, and they're not, it it's, would be unusual to pass it with any restrictions, but special uses can be passed with restrictions and tied to specific site plans and, and specifics of a proposal. The amendments are like a general change in the law. So we are not a decision-making body. We conduct hearings. We make findings, we make a recommendation to the City Council, and the City Council will decide what to do with the proposals and whatever our recommendation is. Sometimes they follow our recommendation and sometimes they don't. So what we have before us is limited to a text and map amendment. The standards for amendments are extremely broad. The preamble says, and, and I'll read it briefly, the wisdom of amending the text of the zoning ordinance or zoning map is a matter committed to the sound legislative discretion of city council and is not controlled by any one standard. In making their determination, however, the city council should, in determining whether to adopt, deny, or adopt some modification of the Plan Commission's recommendation, consider, among other factors, the following. <clears throat> Whether the proposed amendment is consistent with the goals, objectives, and policies of the Comprehensive General Plan. Whether the proposed amendment is compatible with the overall character of the existing development in the immediate vicinity of the subject property whether the proposed amendment will have an adverse effect on the value of adjacent properties and the adequacy of public facilities and services. Of course, being a political body, the City Council can consider other things, uh, whatever they believe is relevant. <coughs> we have a new set of rules, and a copy is out at the, at the desk, and the new rules adopted in late last year include some time limits and a slightly different order of presentation. So we'll go forward under the new rules and um, uh, see what happens. Craig, how do I make this go away? I will mention one other thing. If you are planning to speak either in favor or against the proposal, there is a sign-up sheet. And if you put the name on the, your name on the sign-up sheet, we'll, we'll be sure and call you. 
please address your remarks to us from the podium. Since this is a public hearing, we're required to have a recording, and there will be a video recording made of this hearing. I was quite surprised a week ago when someone phoned me and said, did you know you're on YouTube? And if you testify tonight, you'll be on YouTube also. This is uh, made available to the public. Is, is there a risk that this could go viral? <laughs> we will know at the end. Before we start the hearing, uh, let me ask if there's a motion to approve the minutes from March 14th. Motion to approve the March 14th minutes. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 The March 14th minutes are approved. Is there a motion to approve the March 21st minutes? So moved. Is Second. there? Any discussion? The March 21st minutes are approved. That brings us to the third and fourth items, which are the two amendments under consideration at the hearing. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if we're proceeding with the application at this point, that's correct? Yes. Okay. Um, I I'm going to be recusing myself from this particular hearing um, due to the fact that the uh, law firm representing the applicant um, uh, is my law firm and my partner is handling the matter. So on prior occasions, I have recused myself uh, regarding the continuances. So um, consistent with that, I'll be recusing myself today. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Craig Sklenar, General Planner with the City of Evanston. Uh, tonight you see in front of you a, two applications, one for a text amendment to uh, create subarea 6A in the Central Street Overlay District that would remove uh, drive-throughs as a overall ban. Currently, <clears throat> no drive-through, even a special use, is, is allowed under this uh, subarea 6 uh, where the property resides. In addition, there is a map amendment to rezone a R2 residential property uh, to a B1A that would be uh, used with the parcel at the corner of Gross Point Road and Crawford uh, for the purposes of building a uh, Chase Bank. I want to introduce Richard Sapkin from Edgemark Development, who is the property owner at 2628 Gross Point Road. He'll give a presentation uh, concerning their application for both the map and text amendment. <clears throat> uh, thank you. Um, I'm not Richard Sapkin. Um, my name is Scott Borstein. I'm the counsel. It's okay. Uh, counsel for... Uh, uh, here on behalf of Edgemark and uh, Chase Bank. Um, and uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission, uh, for allowing us to present today. Um, and thank you, Craig, for uh, summarizing what's before you. Given that, I will just quickly um, elaborate slightly on the on the two applications. The All right, let me ask if you will be giving testimony or only argument. I will not be giving testimony. I'll be introducing the various witnesses, and they will give the... If you're going to introduce, let me ask everyone who's going to testify to raise their right hand and affirm that they'll tell the truth during this hearing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the text amendment applies only to the property at 2628 Gross Point Road. Um, that's the parcel right at the corner of Gross Point and Crawford, and then the MAP amendment applies to the property at 2635 Crawford Avenue. Um, so, and as I think has been stated, in addition to the uh, two applications that are before you tonight, uh, upon approval and hopeful approval of these uh, amendments, we will then subsequently apply for a special use uh, and an alley vacation uh, to complete the entitlement process for the project. So joining me today uh, are the following individuals. 
uh, is Richard Sapkin, who's a principal with Edgemark Development, uh, Mr. John Krisoff, who's the real estate deal coordinator for uh, J.P. Morgan Chase, uh, Mr. Larry Okrent, uh, who is our land planner from Okrent Associates, um, Ms. Mary Lindberger, who's our appraiser, uh, Ms. Lynn Means, who's the project manager for Sam Schwartz, which is our traffic consultant, um, Mr. Jason Golub from New Dale Architects, who's our project architect, and Mr. Dave Gustafson, from, also from Edgemark. Testifying before you today will just be uh, the following people, uh, Mr. Sapkin, Mr. Okrent, Ms. Limberger, and Ms. Means. So with that, I'll just jump in and start off by asking uh, Mr. Sapkin to approach the podium and provide his testimony. Thank you. Um, would like to uh, thank all of the members of the Planning Commission for taking the time to hear this. Uh, we also appreciate, we know we've had a, a number of continuances as we've been working on this plan. I will try and keep my comments brief, uh, as I know there was a complete package that was submitted to you. Uh, our company, Edgemark Development, purchased the Sitco gas station about a year ago. Um, we, so we are the uh, fee owner of that parcel. Um, we're trying to keep it in as good a condition as we can. Um, the gas station operator has left. Uh, so I was out there uh, as recently as last week just to make sure that we uh, are trying to be a good neighbor in the city of Evanston. Uh, as you s have seen in the past, and I, I mean, is this the pointer here? Uh, you're going to have to... As, as I mentioned, we purchased uh, the Sitco gas station with the intention of redeveloping uh, this parcel. Uh, initially, we were under contract with three parcels. We had a home right here. Uh, we have a vacant piece of land and then the parcel that we have purchased. You have the restaurant next door, then you have the vacant lot that is uh, basically CVS's parking lot and some parking for the, uh, the restaurant here. In a, lot of, I, in a lot of the meetings with the neighbors, we heard a lot of uh, complaints, concerns, issues with the uh, three parcel configuration. So uh, we went back to Chase and explained to them that we really wanted to try and make it more urban and create something that was uh, more in, in line with what was going on in the neighborhood. So we have uh, presented to you, as was mentioned, the, the extra parcel, which is the, uh, the vacant land, so that we would use that for parking and for its, its two drive-throughs and an ATM. So we, um, we come to you tonight with this plan and this, this idea. We understand uh, that there is concerns with the neighbors that the project will be a budding residential. We understand that in any urban development. Uh, we intend to have a very good lighting plan, which will allow for the photometrics to prevent from any lighting leaving our property. We intend to have extensive landscaping, and we intend to build a new fence around the perimeter of the property uh, and it's kind of hard for me to say north because it's, it's on an angle, but say east-ish and north-ish over here. We won't put a fence over there. So uh, the fence, which we will incorporate with the landscape plan so that, once again, there's, there's little or no impact to the neighbors. Um, as I mentioned, we, we've been working on this for over a year. Um, we, we believe that in, in working on this, we've tried to create a design that is uh, something that the neighbors and the city would be proud to have. This will be uh, what Chase calls a, a CPC, which is a Chase private client branch, which is a little different than uh, what you have currently, and just more upscale, a little different uh, than what you have in the, in the neighbors right now. But I look forward to answering any questions, and we thank you again for your time and consideration. Um, Richard, can you flip to the site plan and just briefly describe, you know, how the 
branch is going to work and the size of the branch and maybe some of the materials used? Um, materials, I'm going to defer to the architect. And, and a lot what we'll do is, is what is work with staff on creating a, a design element that, that reflects the importance of the corner and, and how it lays in the intersection. Uh, our current site, which is Sitco right here, um, the object was to create a building that was on the street, giving it uh, a good feel for both pedestrian and vehicular uh, customers. As you can see over here, uh, we're using the alley that's currently there as our access point, and we're using the existing right in, right out over here. So what we've tried to do is minimize, and, and we have traffic experts who are much better than I am about explaining how that works, but uh, the design layout is such that the drive through would be here. We'd have the landscaping and the uh, fencing along here, as I mentioned. This would be one way leaving. Uh, and the alley we would maintain, we actually want to make it so that it's more, uh, it needs to be fixed up, quite honestly. It's, it's kind of a mess back there. Very good. A any questions from the body at this time? Otherwise, we'll proceed to our next witness. Thank you. I don't know if oh. this is the time to ask this question, but I do have a question regarding on point two, on the next page, or a couple pages down from here in the document I have, um, it does, you, you do state that uh, sub area six is adjacent to sub area one on three sides. There is no prohibition to drive through facilities in sub area one. Could you please point out on, on here uh, sub area six and sub area one, please? Can you do that? Or can do that? <laughs> I can find someone that can. That would be helpful. I, don't, I think that would be. I... Yeah, that, that's from uh, city staff that presented that. Uh, if you look at Exhibit F in your packet, there's a uh, Central Street overlay uh, uh, map. There you go. Yeah. As uh, being presented to you, uh, sub area one continues north on Gross Point Road and also uh, south on Gross Point Road, encompassing the, the properties uh, surrounding the Chase Bank. So uh, currently the CVS, the Sitco, Sarkis, and the CVS parking are in sub-area six, uh, and then uh, everything adjacent to it is sub-area one and three. If I may, I, I just want to point out one other thing uh, on the site plan as we're talking about this. I, I want to, the vacant parcel right here is, is a very difficult parcel to develop. It's difficult in its shape. Uh, typically when we develop properties, we like something to be closer to square slash rectangular in order to get the proper amount of building along with the adequate amount of width for drive aisles, et cetera. Um, as you can see on the plat map survey here, the amount of frontage along here is, is tremendously uh, shallow. And so most of the depth really falls into there, which makes this a, a difficult parcel, which is why I believe it's been vacant for so long. Uh, what we've tried to do is incorporate that into and make it feel more as if it's part of this overall development. So I just wanted to bring that so you understood why we incorporated it. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Um, next, I'd like to call uh, Larry Okrent. And Larry, can you state your name and address for the record? Uh, Lawrence Okrent, uh, 122 South Michigan Avenue, Chicago. And uh, what is your business occupation? I'm a planning and zoning consultant uh, since 1970, 42 years now. I'm also an Evanston resident since 1972. And can you give the commission just a few examples of some of the other projects you've done? Um, um, I was involved in, uh, very much involved in the Mather project several years ago. Uh, Church Street Plaza, the McDougall Hotel building. I've done some zoning cases here as well. 
Uh, and I was a witness uh, for the city in a litigation matter involving the rezoning of a parcel on Sherman Avenue that the city uh, succeeded in, in winning. And very good. And I'm going to hand up, if the commission will so allow, um, some materials which reflect uh, Larry's uh, curriculum, or I'm sorry, CV or qualifications, um, and I've labeled it as Exhibit 1. Of, I don't know that you have Larry's because... Um, Maybe not. Yeah. But you, you can always have two copies. Um, okay, so uh, Larry, um, are, are you familiar with, you know, the proposed site and familiar with the proposed amendments for this particular project? Yes. And then in your opinion, are the proposed map and text amendments consistent with the goals, objectives, and policies of Evanston's comprehensive general plan. Yes. And can you uh, elaborate that a, okay. a little bit? Um, first of all, I would point out that the standards for the amendment and the standards for the, the, uh, for, the, uh, for the text amendment and the map amendment are the same standards. There's nuances in it that maybe will come out of my uh, comments. Um, and, I, and I would just reemphasize that approval of these two applications is not approval of the project because the special use project, uh, special use procedure would be the next step. What this does is provide a basis for submission of a special use application. Uh, the, uh, the first criterion is consistency with the comprehensive general plan. This is something uh, we've all worked with. Um, I'd just like to quote the key line. The primary theme of the comprehensive general plan is the recognition that Evanston must allow growth to occur while enhancing the community's special character. And I, I think this proposal is consistent with the theme. Uh, these amendments will facilitate growth. They will enable uh, creative development uh, ideas to be offered for the site, which cannot currently be offered, for example. Um, as for design, we're not here to discuss design, but the special use process gives us an opportunity to opine about design, to negotiate design, and to hopefully produce a design that's beneficial to all parties. The comp plan identifies the location at uh, generally the, the corners of Gross Point, Crawford, and Central as a commercial area. The plan also seeks a compatible mix of residential and commercial uses at the neighborhood level with an emphasis on convenience to the neighbors and an emphasis on pedestrian convenience and safety. Um, if I can make this work. Which, uh, how do I advance it this way? Um, interestingly, you know, this is not a very good picture, but uh, right now this site has four curb, actually has four curb cuts on the perimeter of the site, two on each street, plus the alley curb cut. And one of the things that's offered in this conceptual plan is the idea of reducing these from five curb cuts to two. This is consistent with what we try to do for the benefit of pedestrian safety. The placement of the building at the corner, which I think is a, a fundamental criterion that was just stated here, establishes a friendly edge on two streets. Um, go back to the plan. Where uh, the, uh, and a building of high quality materials engages the pedestrian space. Actually, the setback from the curb here is just as proposed in the Central Street Corridor plan of 30 feet. The comp plan seeks to enhance neighborhood character and environmental quality. Um, right now, we have a blighted situation. The gas station is an eyesore, and I think if you approach this area from the south on Crawford, this is at the terminus terminal point of that view. It's an unfortunate thing that we have there now, and remediating that would it, it greatly enhance the perception of that intersection for traffic approaching from that direction. Um, the comp plan seeks sensitive, actually there's a passage in the plan that talks about sensitive design of facilities at zoning district boundaries. Um, so this is an unusual site configuration. Actually, the frontage of the uh, uh, parcel in the rear is 50 feet, but the driveway is being moved back a bit, so the final frontage number is more like 25 or 30. There's ample opportunity to put the right kind of visual screens in that area. 
I, I mentioned the, the bank building. I think the, I'm, I'm persuaded that the bank is committed to using masonry, uh, cast uh, stone, and other high quality materials. Complan also seeks to ad, uh, ad, advance economic development and job creation. Here we have an enhancement of the city's tax base. This is a high quality building that will pay into the uh, various taxing bodies. And as we all know, the amount that will be paid in will greatly exceed the cost of providing public services. Obviously, no school services, for example, would be proposed. The second uh, criterion is the consistency with the overall uh, character of existing development. Let me move to a, where's that uh, area on? Yeah. Okay. Okay, this is a land use map centered on that, that, that uh, elegant intersection. Um, now, first of all, uh, the, um, the site is within a cluster of convenience uh, development. And we're talking about a B1 zoning here, which is, I should point out, our most restrictive uh, business zoning designed for neighborhood retail. Um, as has been mentioned, the drive-through is not excluded from sub-areas one to the north, south, and east. This particular site is the exception. If we look at the character of development surrounding, this is not exact, not 100%, but very close to being almost all single family houses. It's a very dispersed pattern, has a very suburban uh, sort of feel, and in neighborhoods of this sort, there tends to be a more, a greater reliance on the automobile for short, uh, for convenience shopping. So the provision of a drive through at this location is consistent with the policies relating to uh, uh, residents' convenience. Um, the, um, I, I mentioned previously that uh, I, I, I looked at the Central Street Corridor plan. Everything about the site plan shown in this presentation is consistent with what that plan calls for. Um, and finally, with regard to changes in public service, or as does this, this question is, does this proposal suggest that there will be a greater demand for public services? And obviously there will not be, uh, but uh, one, one aspect of it, of course, uh, the alley behind this uh, property, uh, well, I won't go back to that because I can't. <laughs> There is a public alley here, which uh, the applicant seeks to have vacated. Uh, while uh, granting easement rights to the restaurant owner, the vacation of the alley, of course, will remove from the city the responsibility of maintaining it. So this is a small, but still a plus. Um, that basically concludes my comments. Uh, if you have any questions or comments of your own. Thank you. You mentioned that, uh, uh, that you see this as a benefit to the neighborhood and the city. I, I do understand how you see it as a benefit to the city through the taxes. Um, uh, removing a residential parcel and rezoning it for business, how do you see that as a benefit to the neighborhood? Well, the rezoning of the parcel facilitates the redevelopment of a site uh, that the gas station has been vacant for almost two years, attracting and still highly visible, and uh, no one seems to know when there was an improvement previously on the lot to the rear, um, but it has been a number of years. So nothing's happened. It's not beneficial to anybody to leave it vacant. The, the design of the, of the uh, of building will, will be a plus for the neighborhood, it clearly superior to what we've got now in terms of architecture. As for the drive-through facility to the rear, it's very important uh, that we pay attention during the special use process to the manner in which the boundaries of that parcel are treated. Going back to one thing I said, the frontage on, 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 uh, on the street frontage here, it's only 50 feet and it's going to be reduced. So the, the prevalent character of, uh, of Crawford uh, will not be changed in any massive way. 
in addition, there's really just the, the, the transaction booth in the back. There's no building there. I, I can't visualize what it'll look like, but with proper screening along the street, I think the leafy character of Crawford in that sector uh, can be preserved. Thank you. Do you have an opinion as to whether this site is appropriate for a drive through facility? Well, one of the things about drive throughs is that that's how banking is done these days. Uh, to me, putting it to the rear is better than putting it on the street because it, it's a utilitarian thing that doesn't really want to draw attention in and of itself. Um, the, the character of Gross Point Road uh, and, and the way it's treated architecturally to me is a more significant aspect of this. Do you have an opinion as to whether this site would be appropriate <clears throat> as a drive-through location for a non-banking use such as a um, fast food restaurant? Um, I think that's a different type of use altogether and, and uh, I would scratch my head on that one. Uh, I see some questions from people to my right. Not sure who. Go ahead. You must have the lights on. Oh, lots of them. Well, was not the house to the west uh, part of the original plan? That was my understanding, yes. And what, what's the status of that? I, I take it that's no longer in the, in the plan. Correct. It's no longer part of the plan. Gotcha. Okay. I appreciate. Oh, is it on? Is it on? It is. Okay. I, I appreciate what you've said about the way it will be sheltered from the adjoining residential area. Um, I will ask you, and I, I have to say I have personal reasons for asking this. Um, what about safety for people who use the ATM at night? Um, I have that question is best directed to the bank. It's really unfortunate they, experience. Yeah. No, obviously, you want public safety in anything like this. I, I, I don't think anyone would have would prefer anything but that. But but how they do their security is best directed to them. I could guess that they have cameras and monitors off, but I don't really know. Okay, I'll I'll save that question then. Right, we're we're happy to take it now or save it for the end after the various witnesses have testified. Could a new gas station be built on that property without uh, any special zoning considerations? Well, um, <clears throat> what we know about gas stations today is best exemplified by that Shell station on Oakton, which has 15 pumps and two acres. That's, that's the status of the gas retailing today. I don't think we'll ever see anything, uh, another gas station there. Sorry, can I interject really quick? A B1A does not allow automotive um, gas stations currently, which would require a text amendment for the entire zone itself. Thank you. Um, if there were no other questions, though, I want to bring back Richard Sapkin, who wanted to address the issue about the drive through You had asked <clears throat> about the drive-through. Could it be, I think you asked the question, could it be appropriate for this site? The problem with drive-through for any retailer outside of a bank is that you have to be right up to the window. So the way this site is set up, this could never be used for a fast food or any other type of drive-through because you couldn't put the food in a pneumatic tube. It wouldn't work. So... I know, but I want, but it's it's important to understand. So the drive-through for this is specific for a bank, because a bank you don't need to be right up to the drive-through window. But any other fast food or anyone else, it's a completely different type of use. And so I just wanted to make sure, because we had thought about that. What if this changes uses down the road? What would that mean? This is specifically for the bank. It would not work. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to call next. Uh uh, Ms. Mary Limberger, 
Uh, uh, Mary, can you state your name and address for the record? Uh, my name is Mary Lindberger, and I reside in Evanston at 1017 Ridge Avenue. And what is your occupation? I'm a commercial real estate appraiser. And how long have you been an appraiser? I've been an appraiser for over 35 years. And are you licensed in the state of Illinois? I'm licensed, and I'm a member of the Appraisal Institute. And for how long? Uh, I've been a member of the Appraisal Institute since 1985, and I've been licensed since licensure was introduced. Very good. And then your qualifications uh, were part of your uh, impact report that you submitted that is part of the package, and do those accurately reflect your qualifications? They do. Very good. Um, and have you been to this uh, particular site, and are you familiar with the proposed amendments and, and the proposed project for this? I've been to the site on several occasions, including this evening, and I am familiar with the current site plan and also the standards that are being applied in this proceeding. Uh, very good. And then in your opinion, what impact will the proposed amendments and the project have on the values of adjacent property? Uh, I see no negative impact as a result of this development on the values of surrounding properties. Obviously, the standard that I'm looking at first is what's there, um, and we're talking about replacing what's there with a modern uh, bank building with a drive through facility. I've looked at um, residential values in the vicinity of this site now, I guess on the theory that if an abandoned gas station can't depress your property values, I doubt you know a new, clean, nice, well-lit bank will. Um, I looked at the transactions along Crawford Avenue um, going west from this property. This is a very stable area in terms of home ownership. There have been relatively few turnovers here. Um, there, there, according to the public records, there are people here who bought their home in the 1970s and 1980s and still seem to be the owners. Um, the most recent transactions I found, and they are very few, have generally been between the high $300,000 and low $400,000 range. I'm not offering that as an opinion of the values of those homes, but I'm saying that those are the sort of the price range that I see in the few recent transactions. I also went north of the property and I looked at the developments along Park Place. Uh, that's a small street, ends in a cul-de-sac. Uh, there's a combination of sort of some older, smaller homes there and some large new homes there. This also has been a street where there's been very little turnover in home ownership. Um, the most recent transaction I found there was at $740,000, and that was in 2008. Um, so I'd say that uh, property values here, looking at them historically, they've certainly kept pace with appreciation in the community generally, uh, both on Park Place and on Crawford. Um, I see no diminution in value to these homes as a result of being proximate to a commercial node. This is obviously a commercial node, as, as Larry Ockrand has discussed, a very well-established one. Um, this bank will not in any way change the, the character of that. It will essentially remove an eyesore and replace it with something attractive. However, um, the factors that I also know that um, surrounding property owners think about when you're talking about a development like this is the interface of a commercial use with residential development. That's one issue that people are very concerned about. And also I know that there's concern about the drive-through. Um, as regards the issue of interface between commercial and residential, I think that's inherent in the node we have here. We already have that interface, and it does not seem to have diminished residential property values. It is a pattern of land use that you see throughout the uh, Central Street corridor. You see it throughout Evanston. Um, I also have um, recognized the fact that, that um, this is was a a completely vehicular oriented use as a gas station obviously and now it's still going to have some vehicle aspect to it due to the drive-through. Um, I looked at two banks that are located further east along Central Street, uh, BMO Harris and the First Bank and Trust. Both of them have drive-through facilities. I looked at residential transactions and this would be to the north of these properties. They all front along the north side. They both front along the north side of um, Central Street um, and to the north of them separated by an alley is residential development. I saw no evidence in the sales there that the, the values of those homes have been negatively impacted by these drive-throughs. I would also note these two banks that I cited are about a, a block apart. Between them is, um, I think, a Brian's service station, which is a small, older service station with a lot of vehicles. So, I mean, um, it, it's in those those homes have not, to, to my ability to detect, been negatively impacted by Brian's uh, service uh, facility either. Um, lastly, because this is going to be a new development, um, and um, I, di I didn't certain 
couldn't quite sort of tell how old those banks were on Central Street. I went down and I looked at a project that had been developed at the northwest corner of Maine and Dodge. It is a Walgreens. Um, and it has some similarities to our project insofar as it involved some older commercial buildings and a residential lot. Um, the, the older commercial buildings were demolished. The residential lot was rezoned to a commercial use as is planned here. A new Walgreens was constructed there and the Walgreens has a drive-through. Um, the way the, the site is planned, the, the drive-through is along the north edge of the site and immediately north of that drive-through is a large block of um, townhomes that extends probably for two or three blocks going north along Dodge. I looked um, and there was, I was involved in that particular project on the zoning work. Um, you can understand that the homeowners there were very concerned about that development even though they were currently at that time dealing with an eyesore and, and a Walgreens would be, you know, sort of arguably aesthetically preferable. They were concerned about a new development. They were certainly concerned about the drive through. Um, that area has also been extremely stable since the Walgreens was developed. There have been very few uh, sales there. There have been no sales of the homes immediately north of the drive through And so far as I can tell from looking back in the, in the multiple listing, they haven't even been offered for sale. I find no evidence there that either the Walgreens, the rezoning, or the drive through had any negative impact on the home values. And considering that data and my own perceptions about this area, I have concluded that there's going to be no negative impact as a result of this bank development, and if anything, I certainly think it will be an aesthetic positive for the neighborhood. One other thing, Mary, just in terms of your uh, analysis, in these various examples or that you've seen where, in particular, the Walgreens, where we've re or there's been a rezoning of a residential parcel, has it resulted in any additional rezonings, uh, otherwise known as, you know, commercial creep, if you will? There's been no creep off the corner. Um, that, that intersection uh, also, if, if, if you recall it, has um, uh, a large public use in the northeast corner, but it has retail on the southeast and southwest corners, and there's been no advance of commercial use since that Walgreens came in there. It's, and the Walgreens is surrounded both on the north and the west by residential development. And so in your opinion, do you believe that there would be any uh, likelihood of additional commercial rezoning or proposals to rezone resi additional residential property in this particular area because of this development? And I, I'm assuming you're asking me specifically going west along the north side of Crawford? Yes, but that's, well, and also I guess, I guess theoretically across the street on the south side right. of Crawford. Well, of course, across the uh, street there's already a, a sort of um, vehicular oriented use there which interfaces with residential immediately west of it. If you, you know, drive Crawford going west, it's a very um, intensively, if, if you can use the word intensively with residential, but a very uh, intensively residential area. It has a few institutional uses. There's a church near us. There's some public parks further on. I don't, I think the nature is so well established and the residential character is, is the, the quality of the homes is high. There's little potential here for tearing down any of these homes and, and reusing the sites. They're all very attractive, well-maintained homes. And I don't see any pull for commercial development going further west from here. Very good. <coughs> any questions from the board? Great. We have one more witness then. I'd like to have uh, Ms. Lynn Means, our traffic consultant, just briefly testify as to the traffic uh, issues. Uh, Lynn, can you state your name and address for the record, please? Good evening. My name is Lynn Means. I'm a senior transportation engineer at Sam Schwartz Engineering, located at 3100 Higgins in Hoffman Estates, Illinois. And how long have you been a traffic engineer? Um, for over 14 years. And are you licensed in Illinois, and for how long? Um, I'm a licensed professional engineer since 2004, as well as a certified professional transportation operations engineer since um, 2008. Very good. And have you been to the project site, and are you familiar with the proposed amendments and the project for this particular location? Yes, that's correct. And in your opinion, what impact, if any, will the proposed project have on traffic and traffic safety in the area? 
Um, based on our analysis, it indicates that the increase in projected tra site generated traffic would not negatively impact the operations of the area roadway network. Um, comparison that site to the former gas station use, um, the proposed development would generate um, nearly half the amount of daily traffic um, as well as have a less impact during the peak hours on the adjacent um, street traffic. Um, Upon completion of the development, the study area intersections of Crawford, Gross Point, as well as Central would maintain their existing levels of service with minimal, if any, increase to delay. And um, the result of the development would not require any existing mitigation to the ro area roadway network. Um, the existing roadway geometry and signal timings and phasings would be adequate to accommodate the proposed development. Um, the access driveways as proposed um, are expected to operate at acceptable levels of service um, as well as to safely accommodate the site generated traffic. Very good. Um, that concludes our uh, various witnesses. So if there's any questions from the board, we'd be happy to entertain those at this time. Could you explain the traffic flow, the ins and the outs, the one ways and the two ways? And then the pointer would be this way. Okay. Yep. Um, traffic from the north on Gross Point, which we estimate approximately 10% um, of the site generated traffic would come from, it would enter via the right in, right out access on Gross Point. Um, approximately 50% of the um, site generated traffic would be anticipated to use the drive through facility. So essentially, either they would bank, park, um, and then destined to the north on Gross Point, since this is a right in, right out due to the median, they would then have to egress onto Crawford Avenue and then circulate back up to the north on Gross Point. Um, traffic from the, um, I guess, northwest on Crawford Avenue would, which we estimate about 15% of the site generated traffic, would enter, make a left into Crawford Ave, and then either again bank in or circulate. Um, through the drive-through and then make a right out. Um, traffic from the east on Central and the south on um, Crawford would enter, um, come then proceed north onto Crawford. Um, it would join the traffic, sorry, I put the pointer down there, on um, Gross Point to the south. Those all would require a um, to make a right into the site here. And then the vehicles do have the option then to egress either onto Gross Point and either proceed to make either a right heading that way or they could egress out, continue through. Um, same thing with um, that access point. Um, having that option um, based on existing operations, we know that the vehicles on Crawford Avenue do typically queue to at least this um, driveway point, if not beyond sometimes during peak hours. Um, they do typically um, clear during the cycles, but in the event, based on our analysis, we would anticipate maybe one vehicle queue um, during the peak times. If somebody, say, used the drive-through and they notice a vehicle queuing here, they could tech, you know, go out through this point um, and then go down that way versus making a left out. I just, add, just, just as a follow-up sure. then, for egress, um, cars can go to either of, of the exits mm -hmm. and when they're at either of those exits they can turn either right or left um, they can turn right or left out of the Crawford Avenue intersection only gross point they can only make a right in and a right out okay thank you yeah, yeah. is there anyone from Chase here yes um, I've got a question how many Chase banks are in Evanston today so can we have a uh, the chase representative approached the podium. Oh, any other traffic? I assume then that this you anticipate no change in the traffic light at that intersection. Correct. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? 
Oh, you 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 say that the um, the traffic from the from the Chase Bank exiting mm -hmm. would be half what the the uh, the service station was on a on a daily basis. Yes. Okay. Well, what is the the basis of that? That is, um, it would be based on obviously a fully um, operational gas station facility um, based on ITE, which is the Institute of Transportation Engineers. They have a trip generation manual for that conducts surveys at various uses across the country. And so based on a gas station use with eight vehicle pumps, um, taking that trip generation and then comparing it to the proposed um, Chase Bank facility, which we looked at both um, historical um, Chase transactions that they envisioned for this facility, as well as surveys we conducted at other banks um, throughout the Chicagoland area, and then looked at, as well as the ITE data for the bank, and we took the highest of the bank use to be conservative. Uh, how many uh, customers do you think will use the drive through facility? On a, uh, on, per, per day? On a daily <coughs> basis, um, we would envision, um, let's see, approximately um, 170. Thank you. And so that would be ins and then out. So, a to you know, a total of 340 would be a trip, a total trip. So, 170 coming into the drive through and 170 coming out. Thank you. How many pumps did the previous gas station have? I believe it had eight. Any other questions or about traffic? Seth, did you have a question for a different witness? I had two questions, um, and I th um, one would be for Chase, and, I, and one would be for the developer. Go ahead. Um, so the question I had is how many for Chase is how many I have two actually. So how many Chase banks in Evanston today? Uh, I have our Chase representative come up. Could you identify yourself for the <clears throat> record and indicate whether you've been sworn? I've been sworn. I've been sworn. This is uh, I'm Jonathan Krisoff with um, the Real Estate Deal Coordinator with Chase Bank. I'm sorry. My question is, how many Chase Banks are there in Evanston today? I believe I have them by name, and I believe there are four in uh, in Evanston currently. One is an inline, which we call an inline in a strip, and then uh, three others are freestanding, which will, this will be. Is the inline at uh, Dominic's? That or is the, is that the Skokie and Glenview branch. Um, I. I believe that might be no. That's not the Domics would be our in, would it be an in store? In yeah. So this would be in that a, doesn't count as a bank. <laughs> it is. It does count as a bank okay. branch. Yeah. So is but, that part of your four? Uh, no, that's not part of our four. And do you do a study of customers in the area, or yeah, is absolutely. the uh, do you uh, propose to put a bank there? as a way to generate additional customers, or is it a combination of both? It's, it's absolutely a combination of both. We look at existing customer base, and we also look at potential um, customer base. We look at, we look at obviously, the income of the area and, and uh, the demographics and everything like that, and we think this is, we know, we think this would be a very successful branch for us. Um, we do have a high percentage of Chase customers in the area. I think it's close to 25% of the immediate area. Our Chase customers currently, and um, you know all the all the Chase branches that you mentioned in the vicinity within two mile radius are extremely successful for the bank. Um, you know, very very high deposits, some of the most successful in our entire you know network just uh, nationally. Um, and then, as Richard mentioned, this is going to be a CPC site, which is a new, <clears throat> relatively new push for the bank. It's our Chase private client, which is going to mean probably. Uh, lower transactions, um, probably fewer customers, but it's going to be a you know a slightly more affluent potentially customer, um, and that's going to be a you know it's still anyone can bank here of course, but it, you know a segment is going to be devoted to the CPC. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. And I have, I have board members. Other yeah, I have I have one question. Is that for John? <laughs> John. John. <laughs> uh, you have at least three Chase 
banks in Evanston that have drive throughs If you open this one, will you be taking some of the traffic away from the other three as far as the, their drive throughs are concerned? Yeah, potentially. I mean, there's, there's, we do factor some cannibalization, of course, when we enter, when we have a new branch. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the other, there's, there's potential reduction, of course, from the other surrounding branches, of course. Anyone else? Go ahead. Let me ask my, sa let me ask my safety question again. Yeah. What provisions do you have for the safety of those who use the, a the ATM? Well, I'm one. I'm not. I'm not the expert on our safety. We have a whole uh, group dedicated that, of course, is a huge, you know, important, important part of an uh, initiative for the bank. And I'm not on that team. However, I know, um, you know, some of the the talk of shielding it from the shielding the facility, the drive-up facility from the neighborhood, uh, from the adjoining parcels. Um, the ATM and, and the facility and the ATM, there's going to be one in the drive through and one in the, uh, in the vestibule. They're going to be task lit, highly lit, highly visible, cameraed, um, and, and the security will be to the highest level that we, you know, we have now. It's going to be you know, a brand new facility, so. Thank you. Yeah. I have a question for the developer. Um, when you're developing uh, the site, the bank is being built over where I'm assuming the gas tanks are today. Correct. Uh, will those be removed? Yes. We have, uh, when we purchased the property, we were able to conduct an existing environmental study. And we have recently met with the environmental people to determine uh, the removal of the tanks. So uh, we're fortunate that there is uh, no contamination. Remediation will be nominal. But yes, we will remove all the tanks as well as the building uh, from that property. So that's a plus for the neighborhood then? Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have anything else? We do not. Is there anyone here who is, uh, wishes to support the proposal and who has not spoken? Uh, let me ask everyone who, hasn't, who plans to testify and hasn't spoken, uh, raise your right hand. Do you promise to tell the truth at this hearing? Uh, please come forward and identify yourself. And we'll, we'll hear next from people who are supportive. Hi, uh, my name is Craig McClure. So uh, hello, everybody. We've been emailing for quite a bit. And uh, I wanted to come and put a face on the support for this proposal. I live on Princeton Avenue, right where it intersects with Old Orchard. Uh, I back up to commercial property at the corner of Gross Point and Old Orchard. I look out my back windows at Alden Manor. Out my kitchen window, I see that 12 million gallon tank sitting up there, so this is all very commercial. So we moved here from Philadelphia about seven years ago. And when we bought the home, our taxes were $6,200. Last year, I wrote checks over 10000 We need the commercial base. You know, I know we keep saying that, but I wanted to put a face on it. You know, we're trying to save for retirement. We have other things we can do, but $10,000, that's a lot of money for an 1,800 square foot rancher. So that's my story. Uh, I think this is a real plus. We get rid of a blighted property. There is no cost to the city. The tanks are in good condition. Let's get them out now rather than waiting for it to be a problem. You know, to me, this is a win. I understand a lot of the concerns that are raised, but I think, you know, in the scheme of things, when I hear that this is half the traffic that a gas station would be, you know, to me, I'm not seeing the issue that others are raising. The church is right down the street. Apparently, there's not a problem with the traffic there. The food pantry, 
you know, there's any number of traffic generators in that area. And this one doesn't seem to be a problem, in my opinion. So, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll now take uh, cross-examination, or other statements in favor, and then we'll take cross-examination of the people who have spoken. Could you state your name and indicate your address and whether you've been sworn? I have been sworn. My name is Judy Chudak, and I'm at 2669 Crawford, which is five houses. I consider Crawford to be a North Street, but I guess I'll say West of the proposed um, development on the same side of the street. Uh, one, I'm very appreciative that we had a new proposal come in today that does not include the demolition of an existing home. I think that was definitely my biggest concern and why I was not previously in favor of this particular proposal. Um, I think there's still concerns out there, and I'm sure we'll hear some. Um, I like the fact that there is not an automatic drop-off onto Crawford Avenue from the um, drive-through. Uh, I think maybe in one of the initial proposals, it looked like it was going straight off. It's kind of a turn, so there is an opportunity for cars to go off on Gross Point, which is not truly a residential street. Um, for those of us that live on Crawford and for those that live in Princeton and Hillside, and there's been a lot of concern about too much traffic going that way. So it's a good thing that we're seeing that there's an opportunity to exit on more than one um, direction. Uh, I'm glad to see that there's uh, been addressing the lighting issue. I know that there were neighbors at the community meeting that live on the other side um, that were concerned about the lights coming down. And although I don't understand the um, specifics of the high-tech lighting, I will have to um, accept the fact if they say that the lights stay in that area, it won't be going out to the community, which is nice. Um, Lastly, at the last community meeting we had, and I think this might have to do more with the special use, but I'd like to just bring it up. Um, the Edgemark folks said that they would be willing to put into the proposal certain types of businesses that they would not be able to sell to should this bank at one point turn over. And I would just like to know at some point, um, maybe someone can address that, how we go about trying to get that list to them, such as um, fast food, uh, liquor stores, things that are not family oriented, residential, and certainly things that are after hours. Um, with that said, I guess like Craig, I feel that the benefits, if the remaining concerns are kind of addressed, um, kind of outweigh the, the negative uh, impact here. And again, I'm very appreciative of the changes that have occurred in the proposal and uh, the response that we've received. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wish to testify in favor? It brings us to cross-examination. If you have questions of people who have testified, please approach the podium. Uh, give us your name and address and uh, who you wish to ask questions of. Oh, I'm sorry, go I'm ahead. Sorry. <laughs> go ahead. Uh, sorry. My name is Joshua Huppert. I, I live at 2630 Crawford. Um, uh, if, can I ask a question of the commission? Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, many of the neighbors signed a petition uh, after this application was filed. Um, it was our, our understanding that uh, as long as 30% of the property owners within 500 feet signed a petition opposing the proposal, then the proposal would require a 75% vote of the city council. What the question is whether that petition is still valid now that the proposal has been changed. Uh, I think the, the petition actually said, it, it was specifically said this is a proposal to rezone two residential lots. So the question is, do we need a new petition or is that one still okay? I will ask our legal counsel to consider that question and maybe at the end of, toward the end of the hearing, he will have an answer and, and then he'll tell us and maybe he'll need to look at the books. 
Okay. In which case he'll let us know how that answer will be communicated. Okay, thank you. Um, I also, um, I'm, I'm gonna wanna request a continuance because this new plan has only been out for a few days and it was a holiday weekend. Um, I think we're, we may need a new petition. I think we're gonna need uh, to get an appraisal um, uh, uh, of our own about the property values. And I'm waiting for, uh, still again, waiting for information from the police department about, uh, tra I'm waiting for copies of traffic reports, which I've requested a couple times from the police department. So I'm gonna request that uh, there's gonna be another date to allow us time for those things. Un under the rules, uh, people living within a specified distance of the property are in entitled to a continuance. Um, the best way to do that is uh, before we've closed testimony, uh, write out your request and where you live and how far it is from the property on a, on a piece of yellow paper and present it to us and uh, we'll look at it and if it requires a continuance under the rules, you'll have one. Okay, thank you. So I'll do that later this evening? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, um, so now of questions of witnesses, do I ask you or I ask? Ask, ask me the questions and um, they need to pertain to what the witnesses said, but because okay. it's cross-examination and they need to really be questions instead of, and not statements veiled as questions, but go ahead. Okay, well, um, from the uh, appraiser, Ms. Lindberger, I, I would like to know her opinion of the value of the vacant residential lot at 2635 Crawford. If you are able to answer that question, please uh, come forward. We we're recording, so we need to, to have you in a microphone, in front of a microphone. I have not researched the value of that lot. I know it has been offered for sale, and I know it's under contract, and I don't know the contract price, so there are probably here people tonight who do know that who could answer that for you. Okay. I, I was wondering just about the value as an as a R2 lot. Again, I'm, you know, I, I'm, I'm a stopped from offering opinions off the top of my head. We appraisers love to do that, but we're cautioned not to do that. Um, but I would say that probably um, the value of this property would be enhanced in terms of its, the fact that it's going to be acquired for a commercial use. So it would be worth more as a commercial lot than, a res than an R2 lot. Okay, thank you. Um, that's my only question <laughs> for you. <coughs> Um, and from the traffic engineer, I'm wondering whether she has studied um, the, the record of accidents at the, it, it's one, it, I guess it's technically three intersections, Crawford, Gross Point, and Central. It's kind of one big, big intersection, but I'm wondering whether she's looked at the, the history of traffic accidents there. Ms. Means, could you come forward? Um, no, I have not um, reviewed actual reports um, for those accidents, but as previously indicated, um, the volume of traffic um, that will be generated by this development is not going to impact either the levels of service or delay of those three intersections. So if there is a safety concern um, that exists right now, this development will not negatively impact impact it and or um, exacerbate an existing condition. So you're saying there won't be more traffic from a bank than there is currently? The amount, uh, there, there's an increase in traffic, but we would not expect it to um, negatively impact those intersections and or the safety of those intersections. Okay. And you made a statement that Chase Bank would have a, about half the traffic of a of the previous gas station when it was open? Um, a fully occupied gas station, yes. Okay, do you have any specific information about how many customers a day the Sitco station had when it was open? Um, what I have is industry standards for a um, eight vehicle, um, vehicle fueling position gas station. Okay, so that's not the so same as So it's not, um, okay. 
it, and like I said, it, it obviously since the gas station closed, it probably wasn't occupied. You know, at some point it was probably operating at full capacity, but obviously since it closed, there's probably an issue why it closed. Okay, so you don't really know that the Chase Bank traffic would be less than the Citgo traffic was. I'm comparing um, industry standards to industry standards. But do you at know? The gas do you station. know whether the Chase Bank traffic would be less? Or then more than the Citgo? We would expect the Chase Bank to be 50% um, less on a daily basis based on industry standards. But do you know that? I think it's been asked and okay. answered. Yes. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, that's the only questions I have for you. Thank you. Um, and I don't know who testified about the ATM, but I'm wondering about what the hours of operation for the ATM will be. I don't know who. Yes, sir. As John Lee Christoph, uh, the ATM will be 24 hours. Thanks. Um, and my last question is for Mr. McClure, who testified in favor of the proposal. And um, I'm pretty sure I saw a uh, a document in the packet that the plan commission has. It wasn't signed by Mr. McClure, but I think it had his name on it, that said that he um, instructed his real estate agent not to show him houses on Crawford. And I'd like to know why, if that's true, and if so, why he didn't want to live on Crawford. Mr. McClure? You know what, when we came out here, our realtor showed us properties on Crawford we quickly recognized that it was a busy street and we didn't want to live on it. You live on a commercial street, okay? Well, we you're we asking me a question, okay? No, I live in a residential district. To, we told our realtor, we said, stop showing us houses on Crawford. We want to live on something a little more residential. Now, as I testified, we back up the commercial property and we're only one house off of Old Orchard, but my point is that I think many of you have tried to represent Crawford as some bucolic country lane, and it's not. And I think as one of the neighbors the other day talked about, before the old orchard exit was put in, which, you know, that's before my time here, apparently your part of Crawford carried a lot more traffic as people were going out to the north entrance on the Edens. So, that was just a perception on our part that said, you know, Crawford's just a little bit too busy of a street and we don't want to live on it. Okay, thank you. Um, those, are, those are all my questions. Thank you. thank you. Is there anyone else that has questions? Um, yeah, hi. My name is Sigrid Pilgrim. I am a resident of Northwest Evanston at 2750 Bernard Place since 1983 when we bought our house. I can fully sympathize with the gentleman about the taxes. Ours used to be less than $1,500. They're now over 6,000, so we can also equate the you know, percentage rises. Uh, when we first bought our house, the street was still unpaved. It cost us $7,000 plus interest to get the street paved. Ms. Um, Ms. Pilgrim, yes, uh, this is a, a time for cross-examination. Yes. yes, I just wanted and to. And it is not a time for statements okay. at the end okay. of uh, a little, little oh, later, apologies. you'll be able to have, make any statements okay. you wish. I do have a question to the traffic engineer. Um, when did you conduct the traffic study? What time of the year was that? What time of the day was that? What was the weather? Our, con our traffic study was conducted in September. Okay. 2011, um, we conducted traffic counts at the um, the triangle, the three intersections of Crawford, um, Central, and Gross Point. Um, we conducted counts during the weekday morning period from 7 a.m. to 9 a.m., as well as the weekday p.m. peak period from 4 p.m. to 6 p.m., as well as um, additional observations out at site on sites during okay. um, various days, probably October, November, December. Um, have you been there in the evening doing a rainstorm and the snow? And do you, have you seen Crawford northbound or northwestbound and the traffic when Edens backs up? 
And can you imagine? Only when, one question at a time, when, please. When, <laughs> okay. I have not um, been on Crawford Avenue um, during a rain or snowstorm. Okay. All right. I would ask you if you possibly would have the opportunity to maybe do this. You can't do it now because we don't have your snowstorms. But imagine cars trying to make left-hand turns onto Crawford during traffic conditions like this, and you have accidents. Is there a question? Um, the other question that I would have would be addressing uh, the representative from Chase Bank. Um, thank you. It is my understanding from reading various articles that the uh, Chase private customer is primarily one that is very well off. The option for this customer is that he or she does not need to stand in line at a teller, but would have a private room where he or she can conduct business, and that Chase's long-range strategy is actually to kind of discourage people with an asset value of less than $500,000 to become a Chase customer. Um, because you don't make as much money of those customers as the ones that are really well off. How does that necessarily correlate to the need for a drive-through? You know, I, I think it, obviously a drive-through is still very important to, to the facility. It serves the, we have existing customers and we have to serve existing customers. Um, I think drive-through, I think probably drive-throughs will become less and less important um, as time goes on. I probably agree with that. It's still very important for the bank. Um, I, I disagree. I don't think there's any, uh, you know, direction of the bank to try to discourage any segment of the population at all. Um, I just think we're trying to uh, acquire more customers in a certain segment. I'll be happy to give you the article. I'll show oh, it to I, you. yeah. You've probably seen it. Um, a second question would be, though, if you have seen the drive through facility of the First Bank on Central Street, there's actually one lane where there is a window, and about a car length north of the window is the ATM machine. Okay. Would it not be feasible to reconfigure the Sidco property in such a way that you could have an equivalent and not necessarily need three drive throughs and essentially leave the residential property alone? You I don't, still I, take the alley for the parking, but, you know, have an entrance where people, where the cars will go off Crawford, make a right-hand turn, go past the window and the ATM, which are in the same line, and then come back out onto Gross Point, which would eliminate the traffic hazard, people making left-hand turns onto Crawford. Um, if I may, we can have somebody address, I think, the question, but it's not necessarily the bank question. It's more of a design issue. And so, you know, if, it, if okay. you don't mind, we can have somebody else, right. you know, address okay. whether there's any, any other possible configuration for the project. Maybe, Richard, you can... In, in order to um, facilitate both the size of a bank that's needed to be there as well as um, the parking, we need to have both the vacant parcel of land and the existing Sitco. Convince me. <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, that's the question the has been answered. The question. Any other questions? No. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else that wishes to cross-examine the witnesses? Please come forward. State your name. Hi, uh, Aaron Nopsinger. I live at 3501 Hillside Road, um, which is across the street and three doors down from the proposal. Um, I guess my first question is for uh, Chase. Um, have you considered the possibility of putting the drive through lanes at the Chase Bank at Central and Green Bay Road? 
Um, the reason why I ask is there's not currently any lanes there. It's a commercial district, and there's actually enough land to facilitate drive-through there as opposed to the residential property. I actually can't answer that. I haven't done the study, and, and I can't really answer that it's, question. It's beyond the scope yeah. of uh, the testimony. Okay. So um, another question. Um, do you have data explaining how many of your customers would be coming from outside of Evanston and traveling from, say, Wilmette or Winnetka, where there is lots of money to get to, versus the middle-class houses that are currently where you wanting to build? Um, you know, this, this concept, the branch here has been extensively modeled, um, you know, and I'm not familiar with how that is modeled and, and exactly where the traffic drivers will be coming from, um, so I can't answer that question. The reason why I ask is, you know, um, for our community, it feels like something like this should benefit our community and the concern of the congestion. Um, last question um, is, uh, do you have data of the validity of a drive-through and an expectation for how long those are going to be worthwhile? Um, currently, Chase spends $1.5 billion marketing that you, now you can go to the bank without going to the bank. If you're a personal business, they give you free check scanners. Did, so did you can you have a question? Oh. It was the first thing, um, the validity of a drive-through, um, and how long you anticipate the need for a drive-through facility. I th we're absolutely exploring all channels to try and deepen other channels um, to provide transactions. Uh, the drive-through is still very, very re relevant today to today's customers, and uh, our customers demand it now. So. Okay, um, question for our traffic advisor. Um, do we have comparison numbers of the current traffic counts versus I, just what was the traffic rate with the Sitco property? I do not have um, comparison at the um, access points to the driveway, but I do have traffic volume counts um, that were conducted at the Gross Point, Evanston, I'm sorry, Gross Point, um, Central, and Crawford intersections in 2007. Um, when Metro Transportation, um, which was acquired by Sam Schwartz Engineering, um, did the signal um, timings out at those intersections. So I do have um, previous traffic volume counts, which from my understanding, the gas station was open at that time to compare to. But obviously, other development has changed um, within that study area as well. You have a Starbucks and other measures to compare, but I do have um, historical counts at those three intersections. Am I able to explain why I asked that question? No. Okay. <laughs> you'll, you'll have a chance, but not Sure. Now. Okay, perfect. Um, uh, ed Edgemark developers, um, question for you is, do we know how long Chase is planning to be on that property? No. And is Chase purchasing that property and going to become the owner of that property, or is Edgemark going to hold that property? Um, Edgemark will own the property. Chase will be a tenant. a tenant. But we don't know how long they will be a tenant. You don't. Perfect. You asked the question. Yes. It will be a long-term lease. But well, I haven't talked talk to Chase about it. But typically, we sign 20-year uh, leases with Chase. Thank you. And... Um, one question just for the designer. I know there was a conversation or a question around um, the current proposal fitting on one lot, but is there the possibility that um, a single drive through window would fit on the current SICO lot versus a three lane drive through? We have worked with staff extensively to look at all options. We've worked with uh, Chase as well. Uh, the configuration of the, the current Sitco lot is, is just not conducive to uh, the bank being able to utilize it, unfortunately. We, we understand, but it just doesn't work. So even with one lane versus three, it still wouldn't work? Correct. If you look at the plan, 
uh, it barely has enough parking to accommodate the bank. That's all I got. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Chris Hobbs. I live at 3510 Hillside. Uh, I will also be submitting a piece of paper asking for a continuance. Um, with this coming right before a holiday weekend, it's difficult, particularly with all of us having normal jobs and not being paid to go through this type of data to be prepared. Uh, I did, however, before the multiple continuances, take a look at the uh, Central Street Master Plan that also had a traffic study done in 2006 and 2007 and tried to compare that to the traffic study done by Chase. So my questions are actually geared towards the traffic engineer. So my, my first question is, uh, was the traffic study uh, completed by GHA engineers for the Central Street Master Plan looked at relative to traffic in the analysis done in November? Yes, those um, counts, I, I, I'm giving more information. Those counts that were conducted um, subsequent to that study were the counts that I previously referenced um, that I did look at. Okay. And can you uh, describe for me what the change in the average uh, daily traffic for the peak hours was? Um, I do have that information. Um, during the a.m. peak at the three intersections, um, I'm sorry. And I should, sorry, I'll clarify it. Specifically uh, northwest and southeast bound. Okay, let me get that for you. Thank you. Apologize, don't have those numbers memorized. Oh, I, but I, do I wouldn't have expect anyone would. <laughs> a table. Okay, so you are looking at which particular intersection? The uh, this would be the uh, Gross Point and uh, Crawford intersection, uh, okay. northwest and northeast, both in the AM and PM uh, peak hours. So this would be comparing the GHA engineer study yes. with the Chase study. Okay. Um, we assumed at Crawford and Gross Point that um, Gross Point is a north-south road and Crawford would be an east-west road. So your numbers in question would be um, Gross Point um, going northbound? No, that would actually be Crawford. Crawford going northbound. Correct. Yes. Um, we had a, um, over the four-year period, um, an approximate 14.8% growth um, over the three years or an annual growth rate of approximately 3.7%. Okay. And, and what was the growth rate in the AM for the southeast bound and then the uh, PM for the southeast bound? Um, southbound in the AM, it actually decreased by 16.6% um, or an annual decrease of 4%. And then in the PM peak, the northbound traffic increased um, by approximately 18.5% over the four years, or an annual 4.6%. And southbound um, decreased by 14.4%, or on an annual basis, uh, approximately 3.6% um, decrease. Okay, thank you. And then, and then back, the first number was a 10% overall increase? during the peak hours? Um, sorry, could you give me that number again, no. please? Um, in general, at the three intersections, if you, are you? Uh, just, just uh, what just I'm interested the, in actually is because of the uh, entrance and exit on Crawford, most interested in just the traffic on the, the Crawford Northwest and Southeast bound during peak hours. If you look then at, um, you would have to, I guess if you look maybe at, let's see, the northbound, um, AM is an overall 14.8% over three years or 3.7% per year annually in the AM. And then the PM northbound is 18.46% or 4.6% increase. Over a four-year period? Over a four-year period. Okay. As, a, as an expert, what do you consider that to mean during peak uh, time for an increase like that over four years? What does that tell us? Um, 
Increases in traffic um, are related to obviously sometimes background developments within the um, general area. They could be related to um, changes in travel patterns, new roadways coming in, uh, new roadways, you know, roadways being eliminated, winding of roadways, infrastructure improvements, et cetera. Okay. What, what is the current level of service again for, um, for that, uh, that road? Um, the overall intersection, apologize. Oops. That intersection of Cross Crawford and Gross Point currently operates at an overall level of service B, which um, level of service is graded on, um, just like in school, mm -hmm. an A to F, um, A experiences minimal delay, and F is your uh, over capacity, significant congestion. And what pleases the uh, level of service for the Crawford Avenue, um, both southbound approach, uh, weekday PM and weekday AM? Crawford southbound approaches at C um, during both the AM and PM, and the northbound approach is at B during both the AM and PM. Okay. And what, what, what does it take to be a level B versus a level C, please? Um, B is, well, A is less than 10 seconds, um, B is up to 20 seconds of delay, and a C is obviously over 20 seconds. It goes to, I believe, 35 seconds. I know it's hard to project out, and you might not be able to answer this, but if this rate of increase were to go for another four years, is it possible that this would be a level of service D at this uh, particular road? I cannot say based on um, we'd have to look at overall the intersection. I would probably look more at the growth in the area, um, and overall the experience in general on those roadways, a fluctuation of maybe, in general, 1% per year um, over the historical roadways. Um, like I said, you'd have to dig back to see whether or not what influenced that. Some of that may be, like I said, in the AM, there's a significant growth there, but you had a Starbucks that came in. Um, Starbucks attracts, obviously, a lot of traffic during the morning peak period. If I it's, may, um, sorry, do we know when the Starbucks was put in? I believe it's 2003. Four years before the first study. I don't know. It it, it was okay. So uh, oh, did, would would uh, something from four years earlier? No, that would impact not. I from apologize. Florida. Okay. Apologize. Thank you. Uh, that's the only question I have. Thank you. Is there anyone else with questions? Sir, please come forward. State your name. Yeah, I didn't swear in. Like, uh, you're you're just asking questions. You're not giving testimony uh, okay. at this point. Uh, good evening. My name is Fernando Ferrer. I live at 2636 Crawford, which is directly across the street. From the proposed uh, entrance and exit on Crawford, um, I have a couple questions. Um, I have a question for Mr. Okrant. Um, hopefully it makes sense. Uh, should I wait for him to come? Please do. Uh, good evening. Uh, Mr. O'Grant, you, you mentioned, I believe, that, that you helped uh, in the Central Street plan, maybe? Uh, no, no. I, I, as part of this assignment, I, I reviewed the document. You reviewed the document. Um, <clears throat> did, did you say earlier that, well, actually, my first question would be, does the Central Street plan allow for drive throughs currently at this location? I don't recall what it says about that. I, I was most of the the the, the attributes that um, I focused on were the urban design aspects of the plan. Is there anybody else? Craig, can you answer the question? question for the currently under the <clears throat> overlay district that is applied sub area six does does prohibit drive-throughs uh, as a special use. Does prohibit. Okay, thank you. Because, uh, Mr. Okren, earlier you mentioned that this proposal, or maybe I'll ask you if you did mention this. Uh, did you say earlier that this proposal was currently consistent with the Central Street Plan? Yes, I did. So, um, so how would it be consistent? How would this proposal be consistent with the plan 
if the plan actually says no drive-throughs? Well, as, as we just uh, heard with this clarification, um, that sub area six does not allow drive-throughs as a uh, special use. Um, um, so uh, the application tonight seeks a zoning change to, to identify that as a special use. My comments uh, were more focused on the directives relating to variation in architectural style, variations in building materials, addressing the street space, making it friendly for pedestrians, all these types of things that establish a sense of place that can be enjoyed by the populace. That was my focus. So then would you then say that if we were to focus just on the drive-through rule, that this plan is actually not consistent, just focusing on the drive-through aspect of it? I, I'm sorry. That's okay. That's, that's why we're here. That's the change that's requested. So, it, but my question is still relevant, or are you saying that? It's sort of asked and answered. Okay. I, mean, it's, it's, I just okay. reminded that yeah. He can I answer thought I was it if you wish. a pretty good point. Okay. Um, but but reminded that the Central Street moved. Corridor has a number of drive through banks, as a matter of fact. I mean, you've moved from question to argument. Okay. I mean, it was a question, it wasn't an argument. Just well, a simple question. Just, I mean, because he mentioned that it was consistent with the Central Street plan, but I think facts would say that it's not. That's you've established that. Okay. Thank you. Um, Thank you, uh, Mr. Ogren. That's, that's all for you. Um, I, I have a question for the traffic engineer as well. Good evening. Hi. Um, could you elaborate a little bit more about the effects of parking on streets such as Crawford? And I don't think Crow's Point allows any parking, but Crawford does. Could you elaborate? Because you failed to earlier, which I think is very important. Could you elaborate on the, the parking Crawford. Sure. Um, currently, there, as you indicated, there's no parking along Gross Point, but yes, Crawford Avenue does um, have on-street parking, um, and particularly of concern, um, which was um, highlighted within the context of our report, was that due to the um, queuing on um, the southbound approach of Crawford Avenue. Um, as indicated, it does clear between cycles, but it does queue. Um, and in order to facilitate, while we expect minimal traffic to be coming to and from um, the north on Crawford Avenue, but to facilitate um, traffic along Crawford Avenue, we did recommend that um, parking be removed um, in this area directly adjacent to um, to the site to facilitate in the event that there was a left turn movement there. But again, that would have to be um, approved and um, through the permitting process. So our, so your recommendation was to remove parking. Um, I'd, I'd like a little more detail as far as, because removing parking is very important. I'd like a little more details to what your recommendations were. What were the parameters of removing the parking? Was it 10 feet? Was it, you know, was it to the corner? A minimum of one of one car length, one to two car lengths adjacent to there. So basically, a vehicle could get around um, a left turning vehicle in the event it was queued. And obviously, that, like I said. Okay. Um, I just just by looking at it, and, and I am going to get to a question. Just by looking at it, um, the the left turn. If you if a car is traveling south on Crawford, the left turn into the bank would be very close to my driveway. So, so now comes my question. Um, if, if, if cars are now going around the car to take a left into the bank, how am I going to pull out? The vehicles that um, we anticipate to be queued there, um, we do as part of our study analysis to see whether or not um, the volume of traffic would warrant um, a left turn lane, which then would in turn essentially want, warrant the removal of that parking based on the projected 
queues and the volumes of traffic turning into their left turn lane is not warranted. So in theory, um, the, the um, parking along there does not need to be removed. Um, and vehicles could essentially wait behind a vehicle in the event that it was waiting to turn left into the site and then parking would not meet, need to be removed. We just as part of our study made a recommendation that um, to facilitate through movement traffic that may be um, desirable. Okay, so, so it goes back to my question. Um, did you, when you guys did your traffic study, did you take into, did you study for instance, um, there's an alley there. The alley on the west side of Crawford would not be removed, so that's the alley I'm talking about. There's an alley there, and then there's my driveway. So I, I still don't see how I'm going to pull out if cars are going around a left-turning car. Did you guys, I, be, so my question um, was, because I want to stick to questions, my I'm question sorry. was. You stated the question. Oh, I did, okay, okay. Yeah. I, I, there was a, a Sitco gas station there where it did have a, driveway there is a um, access to the alleyway there so it would we would expect operations to be similar to existing uh, okay that's not true but okay. we would not expect um, there to be any issues um, similar Until today um, we would expect there to be breaks in traffic as there are today for you to pull out of your driveway we would expect there to be similar operations to that Okay, thank you. But, but my question was, did you, when you guys did your study, did you take into effect the alley and my driveway I, as part of the safety and traffic engineering? We did not look specifically at your personal driveway. The reason why I say my personal driveway is because it is right there. That's the only reason. If I lived two blocks away, we wouldn't be talking about my driveway. But, okay. Um, so that's, that's it. Thank you. Uh, I have a question for the, the developer, I believe. Let's, let's, let's get it. You okay. um, could, you, could you tell me the square footage of the Sicko lot? I mean, I don't expect you to memorize it, but maybe somebody has that. The square footage? More or less? 11,000 11, square feet. Um, and, 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 and your company has built other Chase banks? Is that Correct. true? Correct. Okay. Um, has your company built Chase banks that fit on 11,000 foot, square foot lot? No. Okay. Do you know of any uh, any other Chase banks? You're probably going to say no, but do you know of any other Chase banks that would fit on an 11,000 square foot lot? I do not. Then I'd like to ask Mr. The Chase person a question. How you doing? Um, do you know if there are any Chase banks? because I'm sure that you guys have different sizes of banks in different locations. Right. Are there any Chase banks that you know of that fit on an 11,000 square foot lot? I mean, we have Chase banks that are inside Dominic's, for example, they're 500 square feet. And we have banks, we didn't typically in our suburban uh, branches, they're on an acre. Um, so like over 40,000 square feet, so they range. But, but is there, do you know of any banks, Chase banks, that fit on an 11,000 square foot lot that's not necessarily inside of a Dominix because there's no Dominix here? Right. Uh, right. Right. I, I believe we're, talk, we're talking about this specific site, and it, 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 wouldn't, not, it, it wouldn't work in this particular site. I, 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 right, but I'm not talking about this sp particular site. I'm talking about a site that is 11,000 square feet. Could a Chase Bank fit there? Not this proposal. I recognize that this proposal right. doesn't fit there. We're, we're outside the scope yeah, of, I don't, I don't, I of can't answer uh, that question. Cross, but I will allow you to answer if you know the answer. I don't know it's the not answer relevant? to that question. I didn't say it was oh, relevant. Okay. The, the square footage of the sickle lot is 11,000 square feet. I said I you can know. go ahead, and, oh. and if he knows okay. the answer. Do you know the answer? I, I don't know the answer to that question. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Friedman has a traffic question. Yeah, if I could uh, ask engineering. When you uh, did your study, did you take into account other chase locations to determine where traffic would be coming from? We did. We um, were provided information um, in theory looking basically our, our trip distribution is um, based on the um, 
travel characteristics of the adjacent street traffic, um, competing opportunities, um, as well as the proposed access and egress points and the operational characteristics of the adjacent street traffic. Okay, because, you know, I, I went on Chase's website because I wanted to verify, and I'm going to correct the record about how many Chase locations there are in Evanston. Would, would you like to be but, sworn under oath? <laughs> sure. I don't think I have to if I'm... Uh, Go ahead. Uh, but, uh, Go ahead. There are, uh, on Chase's websites, there are 13 bank locations and ATM locations in Evanston. There are seven branches in Evanston, and this will be the eighth branch. So the reason why I looked at this was because I wanted to understand the traffic patterns as well. And I think you may be underestimating coming from um, the... And I'm not an engineer. So I'm just a, I'm just a board uh, a commission member here. But I, I think you probably are underestimating the traffic that's going to come from the southwest down Crawford. Uh, in terms of locations, I mean, you can almost walk to two Seth, other. do you have a question? My question to you was. Lots of time for yes, discussion. Okay, my, my question to you was about did you take into account other Chase locations, and you said you had. Yes, we took in as well as other um, non-Chase banks, just looking at banks in general, not particular to Chase banks as well, because all bank uses, in essence. But this was targeting uh, the, uh, the, the elite of the elite uh, Chase customers, or at least those. And if you look where the neighborhood is, if you look demographically to that, is that Northwest? Um, it seems that is probably where uh, a significant number of their customers that they're targeting will come from. Yes. That's my opinion, right. but sure. that's why I was um, asking, did you look also, at other Chase yeah, also locations? Also, as well, an important thing to note um, as a basis for chip generation, in particular for bank uses, um, studies have shown that approximately 40, I believe over 40 percent of um, bank traffic does pull from the adjacent street traffic, essentially pass by traffic. It's a convenience for traffic passing by that pulls off the roadway, turns in and turns out. So looking at the adjacent street traffic, the vo volumes, the characteristics is very important as well. So that, in addition to competing opportunities, is very important in considering our distribution estimations. So it's not solely just you know, where Chase Banks are. Other banks in the area, because people do have a choice and convenience is important as well. And then for the traffic, then I think you may have answered it to the previous gentleman, the previous question, uh, the percentage of traffic that does uh, come through uh, heading, uh, that's a weird angle, but uh, from the northwest. The Crawford Northwest, yes. yeah. um, are you looking for what are... No, the percentage of total traffic compared to uh, coming down the, the other... Is that, is that going to the bank or going, going to through the, the intersection? Total traffic going to the intersection. Peak hour wise, if you look dr the, pr the traffic directly adjacent to the bank, if you look on um, just looking at Gross Point and just looking at Crawford adjacent to Crawford, you have um, during the AM approximately 400, just over 400 going southbound. I'm just wondering percentages. Percentage so, yeah. wise. And then how does that correlate to the number, to what you show queuing coming in? Um, we looked at that analysis, and that was, again, the basis for our trip generation perception. So overall, um, if you look at maybe, maybe our pass-by traffic um, that we have shown on our figures. I think um, Seth is asking about percentage to the intersection yeah. rather than percentage going to the bank. Percentage. Well, I guess going through that intersection, you have to base it on the access points. And so essentially, um, all of your entering traffic um, that's coming from the uh, roughly 90% of your um, entering traffic is all coming in through that intersect um, through the Crawford Avenue access point. And egressing, um, again, that's based on the characteristics of those the people going to the north, um, most likely they're going to come out of the Crawford Avenue, uh, the north on Gross Point, most likely they're going to come out of the Crawford Avenue intersection and or maybe they would meander through the um, alleyway and try to um, access onto Gross Point that way. Um, so you will have a split of 
exiting traffic that will come southbound, we would expect it at least to maybe be, you know, at least, you know, 60% of the traffic that's from the site that's generated would act, you know, travel um, through that act, through that intersection. Yeah, I, I think you misunderstood, but it's okay. I will I will review the numbers myself. Mr. Ford has some traffic questions also. Two, two questions on, on traffic. I think you said you estimated a total in and out of about 350 trips a day. Um, it's actually 620 total. 620. The, the drive-through traffic um, would be approximately yeah. 340 of that 620. Wait a minute. 620 total. So that's 310 coming in and 310 out on a daily basis. Okay, and of that, 340 would be drive-through. 340, 170 in, 170 okay. out. Now, of that 340, mm -hmm. can anybody estimate how much of that would be ATM traffic and how much of it would be teller-related drive-through traffic? What I'm trying to get at is, of that drive-through traffic, how much of it is happening during normal business hours as opposed to spread out um, over a 24-hour period? We would, just based on historical data, we would expect um, on the order of maybe 40% of the traffic at least or more to occur during the peak times, um, the 7 to 9 and the 4 to 6 peak period, and less traffic to occur at the ATM later in the evening. 60%? Uh, about 40, uh, just based on our numbers that we have, um, we would expect um, a significant portion to occur during the peak times. During the peak times. Yes. Thank you. Um, how does the uh, traffic compare with uh, uh, what you would find at a shell station in eight? An, an eight unit shell station. I think you said it's a total of 640. And on at a shell, uh, well, or whatever. at a gas station that has eight vehicle fueling yeah. positions, just based on industry standards, we would expect on a daily basis about 1,300 um, yeah. total daily trips, 650 okay. and 650 out. Any other questions? I'm Allison Cook. I live at 2721 Thayer Court, about a block from the property. And uh, I think the Chase representative, um, it's a, the, um, the Chase rep, uh, John, you said that for safety reasons, the ATM will be highly lit. I think was your word, so that would be the drive-through and the walk-up, if there is a walk-up. And I'm, I would just uh, ask you to, if you could explain how you intend to control that light from leaving the property, if it's going to be highly lit. I think that's a great question. It's probably best for our architect to answer that, okay. because he's the designer of that. Okay. I'm Jason Gallup with New Dell Architects. Uh, what we'll specify for this site is called a full cutoff light fixture. Um, it's something new that we've been using on other chase sites lately. Um, it does not allow light to bleed on past the property line. Okay. And what about the light that reflects? So it, does they, do they um, point down then? Yeah, we haven't uh, really created a full photometric plan for this site yet. Um, obviously, we're in the preliminary stages here, so um, I can't really answer that. Exactly okay, so you right. don't know how they how you keep the light from ambient light from bleeding off the property and well, it's or a full reflecting up from light that's projected down. That's something that we'll take into consideration in our design. Okay. And the, the chase sign, the neon signs, is, will that also not, will that be off at night or how will that not um, glow into the neighbor's bedroom? Um, the illumination of those signs aren't too bright, uh, but I believe they are on all night. Uh, we call it dust till, till dawn. So. Okay. Where is the sign? Oh, I'm sorry. The, uh, may I? You can restate the question. Uh, the, someone and asked. and since we're not doing the site plan, he may not know the answer. But okay, they just wanted to know where the sign was going. Yeah, to I'm be. not sure at this point. Thank you. I have a quick question about the 
the site plan. Okay, tell us your name and address and my name's the Elisa. site plan's not really before us, so oh. they may not have answers. Okay. My name's Elisa Isaacson. I'm at 3428 Park Place. I'm directly behind the um, residential lot that where the drive throughs will be. And um, as I look at the site plan, there's something along it. You know, I assume that's a fence. So I'd like to know something about the fence. I'd also um, like to point out that there is an unopened alley um, along there, of which we have been granted a four-foot easement, and we have our fence um, to the back of that. So I want to know how much of the easement you intend to use, and then what kind of fence it would be. On the fence question, uh, our intention would be to put a, a six-foot uh, wooden fence new along the perimeter of the property. Uh, six foot is what is uh, currently allowed by uh, city code. I believe we can go to eight with a variance, but typically six foot. Uh, in regards to the uh, alley, we haven't gotten to all of that. I mean, the, the purpose of, of utilizing the alley was to minimize the traffic impact, remove a couple of the other access points, and then be able to improve the alley. So. My my question actually was about a different alley that is not on your diagram. You're where, further where to your, the... Where your fence is, that is on my plat, an eight-foot alley, an unopened alley. Can you show me where? All right, can you, can you, um, do you have the survey? Oh, here. I right can. along here. Wait, let me go to the, oh, oops, sorry. sorry. Let me go to the survey. Is that better, or are you better yeah, with no, this? Yeah, no, 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 it's fine. Okay. Um, no, the other one was fine, too. Okay. Um, right along here is an eight-foot unopened, it's eight-foot wide unopened alley. And we were granted, um, about five years ago, we were granted an easement for four feet of that. Right. Uh, uh, the, the plan does not call for touching that alley. It's a public alley. It'll remain a public alley. Um, in terms of the fence, um, I think the fence there, if you're happy with it, I'm sure they would leave the fence if you wanted a new six-foot fence well the fence is on my four feet I would like an, an additional fence because I am I mean this is not <laughs> right we can get we can discuss that with you okay any and other questions I had one more question for the um, real estate appraiser Um, I'm, I'm asking specifically about my property, which is adjacent to the back of that. But and and I know you said there is no, you know, there have not been many sales along that area of Park Place. And my question is, what do you um, feel will be the impact on specifically my property with 340 cars a day coming through and shining their lights in the direction of my backyard? Um, now you're <laughs> on Park Place, is yes. that correct? Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to be bold here, and I'm going to say if that um, uh, restaurant there hasn't hurt your property, I don't think anything can. I mean, I'm being very, mm -hmm. very bold here. Um, no, I'm just questioning the light. Right. You know, as people come around into the ATMs, we'll be shining directly into the back of the house. Now, you know, and I'm not following your analysis here in terms of the transit of the lights, because I see you as up here and, and highly um, highly blocked by foliage, so you're going to have to show me where you're talking. Well, I have foliage. I mean, I knew something was coming, so I've been building for five years, but right. um, it, the light still does come through. What, what we're looking at mm -hmm. is, and we will do a study for all the adjoining properties, okay. uh, that we will make sure that there is no light from any of the cars coming in we will both landscape uh, with the fence, and if necessary, we will work with you on landscaping on your property uh, as well. So we will make sure, as a, as a good neighbor, that we will uh, make sure that there is no light coming to your property or anyone else's. Thank you. I have a, a light on in case <laughs> someone has a question. Um, Chase is seeking to, to change his zoning year from an R2 to a B1A. I'd like to know what permitted use is on a B1A zoning. A assuming at some point down the road Chase, Chase wants to sell the property or go out of business, what, you know, what would be allowed in that uh, zone B1A?
Sorry, give us one second. We're looking up. I, uh, I should have done that before I came here tonight, and I apologize, but um, I'm looking down the road a little bit. While they are looking for the answer, let me ask if there's any other questions. Hearing no questions, I suggest we, ah, you have a, we'll, we'll do another question. Uh, just a quick question for the safety engineer uh, and the traffic flows. Um, are you aware that uh, Loveless Park is right around the corner from this proposed uh, Chase Bank? I apologize, you said. Um, are, you, are you aware that Loveless Park is right around the corner of this proposed Chase Bank? The adjacent land uses along Crawford? It, yes, if you head north on Crawford, take a right, it's basically one of the main entrances that people in the neighborhood access Loveless Park. I, I am aware of it, yes. In your safety study, did you look at pedestrian traffic or bicycle traffic that also is on Crawford Avenue? We did as part of our traffic study when we counted the um, traffic volumes at the adjacent, those three intersections, we did count um, pedestrian bicycle traffic as well, as well as our traffic did include um, vehicle classification of trucks. Can you repeat what month you did this? It was in September. September, okay. Um, our traffic is, um, it is desirable to conduct studies during average month conditions as that is what typically um, you would like to design for. Thank you. Uh, that's all. Go ahead. Uh, for the record, Ken Cox from the city's law department. Uh, the following uses are permitted in the B1A district provided that they're less than 20,000 square feet in area. Artist studios and accessory dwelling units, caterers, cultural facilities, dwellings, uh, private educational institutions and public educational institutions, financial institutions, food store establishments uh, that can only operate between 6 a.m. and midnight, governmental institutions, offices, religious institutions, uh, category one residential care homes, type one restaurants, retail goods establishments, and retail services establishments. The, those uses, if they exceed 20,000 square feet in area, are permitted only as special uses. And there are also, are, are also additional special uses, but that was not the question. What's the height limitations? Uh, maximum height in B1A is 40 feet, or three stories, whichever is less. Uh, again, that's, and which, is still subject to variation <laughs> process, but the, the base zoning uh, maximum height is 40 feet. Mr. Hobbs, did you have a question? Yeah, one more question. I'm not exactly sure who to address this to, so I'll ask everyone. Um, in regards to the uh, uh, GHA engineer traffic study, did the recommendations that came out of that with the Central Street Master Plan get looked at for this corridor? In other words, there was a recommendation made, and it's in the Central Street Master Plan for the Sitco property that actually did not envision it as a gas station. And I'm wondering if the property that they recommended was looked at and the level of traffic that is relative to a bank as opposed to a gas station. It, it was looked at, I believe, Mr. Chairman. But I don't know if they came to any conclusions other than what is reflected in the in the overlay district. I know there was a lot of concern about it, and I, lo I know that a lot of uh, members of the Central Street Neighbors Association talked about all all m kinds of things up and down Central Street. And um, if, if I may, it was rezoned from C2 to B1A, and they envisioned retail space and residential, and the daily traffic would be 246. So. Out of the Central Street Master Plan, they envisioned that, I and think, that was the I point of the question. in citizen comment, you sure. can uh, make arguments much more efficiently than in questions. May I ask more? Yes, and then, and then I think most, most thorough question. Go ahead. Thanks. Um, 
I, I'm, I'm just not, I don't quite understand. The, the proposed text amendment would remove uh, drive throughs from the list of prohibited uses, but I don't understand um, which, which properties that would, would that only apply to um, 2628 Gross Point? Would that also apply to other? That's a, that's that, a text amendment. But so. it, it would create a sub area, I believe. How, how much property would, it, would that what text area amendment apply would to? would be subject to that test, text amendment? It, it removes the prohibition, but it does not permit them, except Right, but I'm wondering just for how much land it removes the prohibition. Uh, Craig Sklarn, <clears throat> General Planner, I, their application actually requests the um, removal of prohibitive uses um, as a drive through in sub area six completely. So if as proposed in their application, that would be all areas of sub area six, staff has provided a recommendation that uh, creates sub area six A that would include the Sitco station, Sarkis, and the CVS property uh, that is the parking, their parking on, on site. So uh, everything you would see uh, north northeast of Crawford Road uh, would be a creation of sub area 6A. That was staff's recommendation, but the current text amendment application by Edgemark uh, was to remove from sub area 6. I, I would just point. I'm sorry, I would just point just, out. Just in this area. Just in this area. We're, we're, we're perfectly uh, uh, in agreement with the proposed uh, area that the staff is proposing. Our, our application did include the broader area, but we would certainly accept the limitation on just those three parcels, the corner parcel, the circus parcel, and the, the parking lot parcel to the north. We're fine with that limitation. Okay, thank you. We'll take a 10-minute break and resume at 9.20. We have three requests for continuance from people who live the required distance from the subject property, which is 500 feet. So we will be continuing the matter uh, for those who object to make testimony, get witnesses, um, and prepare. I, I had a request from someone who wants to address the board on this issue, and uh, he described it as neither supporting nor not supporting the proposal, and there is no um, section in the rules for, for that kind of testimony. So if you want to talk now, you could come forward, or if you want to talk at the next hearing, that would be fine too. If you could uh, give us your name. Your name no problem, address I've done this before. Uh, Carl Bova, I live at 1322 Rosalie Street. I'm a civil engineer. I've got about 32 years worth of experience, uh, about half of that within uh, roadway design planning, roadway planning, roadway design, some traffic engineering, um, and a lot of uh, water resources work. So keeping that in mind, and I am registered since 1983 in the state of Illinois with a professional engineer's license and a state of Wisconsin with a, an engineer's license since 2001. And my comments are related largely to the traffic study that the committee members got in their packet. So keeping that in mind, that particular study before you was, was uh, completed before the reduction of the access on uh, Crawford. And it should be re revised accordingly. And that should be reflecting the reduction in the access. The queuing and the delay results may actually vary because the proximity 
of that particular single access point is different from the two that was in the previous and in the packet that you received. By its nature, the access from Crawford Drive is more, dra more dangerous with the only one access point, and it is closer to what is called a crest vertical curve, which is the main intersection that you see on the plan there. When you have such a curve, you have varying speeds, you have more accidents, which brings up a question, that, a, a, a comment, uh, in my opinion, the accident data should be looked at, and to the extent that it's possible, although the standard suggests that you look at three years worth of accidents, in this case, it's probably wise to go further back in time to enable you to get a good handle on what the accident rate was when there was a gas station there, and what the accident rate is when there was not a gas station. There seems to be a preponderance of arguments this evening related to that old gas station. So it's important to consider that. The site itself is on a fairly steep grade, and the handling of this grade will require significant grading, filling, and, and, and or the use of retaining walls. And there's been discussion this evening about shielding and vegetation and fencing. But from a roadway standpoint, uh, having that site, say, elevated three feet, and then another three feet, say, for the headlights, you've got approximately six feet, and so those headlights would be potentially, if not shielded or landscaped, would be shining in somebody's window. The traffic on the improvement will stand out relative to the adjacent homes for this reason. And it does call into question the overall aesthetics and the appropriateness and in the value of the adjacent properties. The traffic study considered 7 a.m. to 8 a.m. as the peak hourly period. However, if you uh, understand at the, the hospital day shift, that traffic probably gets generated much earlier in the, in the morning. I think their day shift begins at 6 a.m. And it is unclear from the traffic study whether any period of time prior to 6, uh, prior to 7 was actually looked into. Keep in mind that all of the, all of the queuing and the delay is based on those peak hourly rates of uh, traffic volume. Any comparison to the old gas station traffic movement and the access are not really appropriate because the old gas station under the current Central Street plan would never be built, would never be allowed to be built, and itself may have been unsafe in its prior life when it was in use. So again, the value of having that accident data is very valuable. Given that fact, the ingress and the egress from the site must be evaluated on its own merits relative to safety and not on the merits relative so, to an unsafe situation that would never be built, i.e. the gas station. Also, within the text, I was not able to find any text relative to the adequacy of the access with respect to the vertical site distance on Crawford, where there is a crest, as I mentioned earlier, at the corner. Such intersections are inherently more dangerous, crashes are more frequent, and especially those involving turning movements. We heard a lot about turning movements in and out of this particular site. It has a consequence related to crashes as well. And that, that um, relationship would be borne out again by studying adequately the accidents 
prior to the closure of the gas station and then after the closure. And uh, finally, um, a comment related to an earlier comment uh, by one of the cross-examiners. It is not a standard practice in traffic engineering to conduct any counts in inclement weather or on any, or on any usual Monday or a Friday or on a weekend unless there's special circumstances like a big shopping center that would you would think would get more traffic during a weekend, which it ordinarily does. And the other exception, of course, would be during a holiday week. You don't want to take traffic. So in, in effect, traffic studies are conducted as best as you can under kind of average conditions so that there can be an, a, a comparison of similar average conditions at other sites. Thank you very much. There has been a request for continuance in order to, to, for people to prepare testimony in opposition to the request. And so um, let me query the board if it makes sense to continue the matter now and then take the testimony in opposition at our next uh, regularly scheduled meeting. Board members are silently nodding their heads, okay mm -hmm. and one not so silent. Well, that's no surprise, is it? <laughs> um, the consensus of the board is to continue this matter to our next regularly scheduled meeting. Craig, what is the date of that? Wednesday, May 9th at 7 p.m. in City Council Chambers. So we will meet on May 9th here in City Council Chambers. Before you go, let me ask our council to answer the question about petitions. Uh, again, Ken Cox from the city's law department. Let me just read the relevant portion of the city code and then I'll explain my opinion. It's subsection 6347, opposition to amendment. If prior to the close of a plan commission hearing held pursuant to subsection 6346E, a written protest against any proposed map amendment signed and acknowledged by 30% of the owners of property whose lot lines are located within 500 feet of the boundary of the area to be amended, inclusive of public rights of way, is filed with the city clerk, passage of the amendment shall require a favorable vote of three-fourths of all the aldermen elected to the city council. I've looked at the petition uh, documents that were included in tonight's packet. They all make reference to the rezoning of two residential lots. The application has since been amended to only include the, the uh, change in designation of one such lot. There is one petition page that differs from the rest in that um, this, all the rest make reference to not only the two lots but also the drive through, uh, the, the re removal of the prohibition on drive throughs. Uh, so they're st they still all make reference to two lots. Um, moreover, the uh, part, the class of affected parties, those who live within 500 feet, has since changed due to the fact that one of the lots has been removed and a number of the persons who signed the original petition may no longer qualify as signers. Thus, uh, a new petition would be necessary to uh, in an, to attempt to reach the three quarters uh, threshold. The, again, the, the code section indicates that the petition has to be submitted before the end of the, he, the plan commission hearing. Uh, however, whether or not the, the petition is submitted at all or whether or not the 30% threshold is in fact reached is not relevant for the plan commission's purposes of the hearing given that it only affects the city council's ultimate determination based on plan commission's recommendation. So they don't have to get it in by the next plan commission, but they have to get it in before the council? They have to get it in, but whether or not they get it in and whether or not it, they reach the threshold does not affect this body's uh, proceedings. This body won't make a judgment about it, but it needs to become part of the record in this case and in submitted this in this body 
So it has to be delivered before, before the end close of the hearing. The next hearing. Yes. We also need to have mm -hmm. the um, submissions read into the record that, that identified for the record. Uh, Craig, can you do that? Yes. Uh, before I do that, I wanted to make one quick comment uh, pertaining to anyone that wishes to present at the May 9th Plan Commission meeting pursuant to the rule changes all documentation that wish, wishes to be submitted and presented at the next plan commission meeting must be pro, must be provided to uh, my office uh, by uh, Friday, May 4th, uh, for it to be submitted and transmitted to plan commission packets. Uh, I'll have my contact information after the meeting if uh, you have any questions. Craig looked at me and asked if I if we have actually read the 175 pages that were submitted and the answer I think is yes and we will read whatever you submit also that's why they look for it ahead of time go ahead Craig uh, zoning text amendment case number 11 PLND 0081 amendment of the zoning code section 6-15-14-6 Table 2 to remove drive through facility from the list of prohibited uses in sub area 6 of the Central Street Overlay District. Also, item 4, zoning map amendment 11 PLND 0076, a petition by Edgemark Development LLC on behalf of JP Ch Morgan Chase Bank, contract purchaser of the subject profit property to amend the zoning ordinance by requesting the City Council to remove a parcel from the R2 single family residential zone and place it within a B1A business zoning district for the purpose of a commercial retail use. Items submitted for these two applications include a memo dated April 6, 2012 from city staff providing background and recommendation from city staff, a proposed site plan dated April 6, 2012, a current survey dated April 6, 2012, a zoning analysis from city staff dated April 6, 2012, text amendment application from the from the applicant a map amendment application from the applicant a memo dated april 6 2012 from the applicant amending their map amendment to one parcel of land a um, <clears throat> packet from the october 26 2011 zoning committee of the plan commission a staff memo from public works dated december 9th 2011 concerning the traffic analysis a traffic impact analysis for the property and proposed site plan dated October 2011, and citizen letters and comments as uh, as submitted uh, at the time of application. We now stand um, in recess until the next regularly scheduled meeting. Motion to adjourn. Not may so I, fast. May I, may I, may the, hearing, the hearing is in recess, but the commission is not in recess. We have other items on the agenda. Uh, Mr. Chairman, before we uh, um, uh, close the, the hearing on, on this proposal, I, I do have a question about why Sarkis is part of this yep. parcel to be changed. Is there a reason for that? The applicant requested sub area six to be re to have drive through facility prohibition removed. Sub area six is a large sub area in the Central Street Master Plan. Uh, the city staff's recommendation was the creation of sub area six A that would include the Sitco parcel. Sarkis, who only owns their building from lot line to lot line and the parking lot that is currently owned by CVS and is, from what we understand, used for employee parking. So those three parcels to create one contiguous sub-area within that. Thank you. Craig, how large is that parking lot? I mean, it looks like it's bigger than the Sitco property. Honestly, I, I don't I can't speculate to its actual size. It definitely is larger, but it's its shape uh, it 
may not be as conducive to, to development than, uh, say, a square lot. And then what happens if you included a Sarkis building into that? I can't speculate on anything that's per, that's not in front right. of Plank Ocean. But if we have a concern about having those parcels included in this, uh, we could make a recommendation to make it smaller and to only include the two parcels of property. Again, what was presented in front of you is, a, is an applicant and a, and a recommendation from city staff. It is up to the commission to make a determination based off on the evidence that's provided to you. Thank you, Craig. Go ahead. <clears throat> when city staff decided to shrink area 6A to create a new 6A, why did city staff decide to include Sarkis and the CVS parking lot? What was your reasoning? Obviously, the concern is we don't want to create a spot zoning situation with one parcel of land. Uh, so we wanted to create the most logical district boundaries uh, that would uh, not open the door for more drive throughs in the area, but uh, to create a, a contiguous district that uh, would allow for that for the Sicko parcel. Uh, uh, I think that by including the parking lot and Sarkis, you may in the future open up those two properties to another drive through. And I would like to see those excluded. I don't know if anybody when, else. Will. When we have deliberations okay. and further comments, it can be addressed. Okay. Do we need a motion to continue this? Uh, no. Okay. We have a, a request that qualifies for an automatic continuance. Okay. I don't believe it requires a, a board motion. Thank you. We'll take a two minute or three minute recess for people to stretch, stand up, whatever they need, and then we'll finish a very small amount of uh, commission business. Let me ask if there, if there are any committee reports other than the uh,